Hello, good afternoon oh, and welcome nine. to the Midday News. This bulletin is coming to you live from our studios here at Kokumlemle in a crown digital address GA0993341 on Joy 99.7 FM. It's also live on Love 99.5 FM in Kumasi, affiliates across the country on ABN Radio in London and around the world at myjoyonline.com. The news is brought to you by UMB Bank, UMB Speed Up, Digibank. Let's go. Coming up, after eight years of service to his nation, former President John Kufour reveals he's yet to be paid his ex gratia. The so called ex gratia. Yeah. I haven't been paid ex gratia. Not by the current administration either. I, I haven't perhaps pushed the current administration. Okay. But you remember. We'll bring you exclusive details as he scores the performance of President Akufuado so far. Also in this package, residents of central region town of Kwaman Number no. 1 drinking stream polluted with liquid waste from a piggery. I cook and sell rice to school people. We have been drinking this water for a very long time. There is no source of potable water. Details in the Joy News Safe Water Project and policy think tank Imani Africa hits back at the Ghana Health Service over medical drone saga insisting the contract is ridiculous and must be revised. I don't know where Imani did this calculation from. Blood, when they are doing the testings and all these things, cost 100 Ghana seeds. And in sports. Now, Paul Dogbe, father in the dethroned WBO Super Bantamweight champion Isaac, has revealed exactly what distracted his son in the build up to that embarrassing defeat to Emmanuel Navarrete. And later in this package, police in Accra investigate incident involving four British schoolgirls and their teacher held at gunpoint and sexually assaulted. Meanwhile, the victims have been flown out of the country. I'm Benis Abubeidu Lansa. Thanks for your company. The details now. He served his nation as president and commander-in-chief of the Ghana Armed Forces for eight years. Today, former president John Ajikum Kufo is 80 and reveals he's yet to be paid his end-of-service benefit or ex gratia. In an exclusive interview with Super Morning Show host Daniel Dazi, Mr. Kufo said he's yet to push for the payment of the money despite failure by previous administrations to pay him. But I suggested it, it, it must be a very expensive exercise. And when you mention money, I'm reminded of this issue that came up about your, your entitlement as ex-president. Have mm -hmm. those been paid? The so-called ex gratia Yes. They haven't been paid ex gratia Not by the current administration either? I, I haven't perhaps pushed the current administration. Okay. But you remember Mr. Chinohese's report, yeah. the Chinohese report, yes. suggested ex gratia yeah. In fact, it was approved by parliament then, even though last days of parliament. The administration that took over from me pretended there hadn't been such an approval. Even though later, some members of the administration, I would cite Mr. Babin typically, when he was being vetted in parliament, he was put that question, said that it was approved. And if it was approved by constitution, then automatically there shouldn't have been any question that I should have been paid. But somehow, uh, the, then may he rest in peace. Maybe. Dr. Oh, Professor, oh, and he appointed a Yamsin Commission and then later changed to a Professor Reb, Reb Amma Committee. Yeah. And so nothing was That's paid good. regularly as extra yet. But uh, not to worry. Mr. Kufour has also been assessing the performance of the current NPP government, headed by his former Foreign Affairs Minister, Nana Kufuado. They have a plate full of things which they're trying to tackle. Uh, radically, uh, but given the time uh, limits to them, it's not easy. But they are, I believe they've done taken some very far reaching steps which uh, should, should be appreciated. Uh, what with the free SHS, radical and positive. I see that uh, the talking of macroeconomic uh, decisions to the Ministry of Finance is also doing something. They've tried to work with the IMF and not accessing credits indiscriminately. They view the bond market with some deftness and, and some profit, but uh, it's still not easy because there's so much unemployment in the system. 
international crude markets, crude oil markets, hasn't played too favorably uh, in the direction of what the government really wants to do. Mm. But I still think they've managed. But point is, uh, whereas to the generality of the people, the grassroots, say if you go to our markets, the market woman would assess the situation by the day. I go to sell today, people are not buying. That's what decides the market woman. Out of 10, you would score them? Oh, definitely within the time frame. I would say it's over 50 percent. Over 50 percent. Over 50 percent. Yeah, mm. over 50 percent. On the Free Senior High School program, oh, Mr. Kufua said he was op- optimistic the program will be tweaked to ensure the country derives the full benefit it promises. Oh, as of now. But policies come in rounded. Along the way, without losing the targets, you, you tweak here and tweak there to get it right. I felt the argument that uh, those who could pay should be made to pay. If you have just one year or two to launch such a program, how do you make yourself the time to say, oh, Mr. A, I look at you, uh, the car, the way you are dressed, you should be able to pay. Mr. B doesn't look as smart as you, so perhaps he's the guy whose children should go scot-free. It won't work. But the whole idea is to move our economy or the people, uh, not society, to the point where literacy becomes the, the culture, the order of the day for everybody to. So government comes in with this holistic approach, free SHS. But then along the way, uh, it should be the managers of the policy, Ministry of Finance, Education, to see how do we ensure that uh, those who can truly afford contribute so we get sustainability to look after. And I believe in due course we will get to know. But if the government has started off uh, being nitpicking those who can afford to pay, look, the informal sector of the economy is far bigger than the former. With the formal, it's easy. Civil servants, uh, the people in the corporate world, you can easily target them. How do you assess the people in our markets, the traditional markets, for instance? Former President John Ajekum Kufu in an exclusive interview with Super Morning Show host Daniel Dazi. To some other stories now, residents of Kwaman Number no. 1 are forced to drink from a stream polluted with liquid waste from a piggery. The worst part of the story is that the same water is what food vendors used to cook for school children in the town. For John New Safe Water Project, Parker Wilson travelled to the area and reports. It's raining hard at Kwaman Number no. 1. And the run of water is red and dirty. The entire community is being washed towards one soil, a stream running through the village. When the rains subside, the stream still has a number of sources constantly directing toxin into it. There is a dark liquid waste from a piggery sited close to the stream that's given off an offensive stench. And bathrooms, out of which wastewater flows into the community's only water source on a daily basis. But this is the water everyone here drinks. It's untreated, dirty, repository of a community's waste. It's obvious everyone at Kwaman number one, including these innocent school children, is at risk of contracting a waterborne disease. Ama Jambia is a food vendor. She cooks and sells rice to school people with the same water. She wants the assembly to save the community from a potential catastrophe. I cook and sell rice to school people. We have been drinking this water for a very long time. There is no source of potable water, so we have no choice. I will plead with government to sink a borehole for us or provide us with any source of potable water to save our lives. Area Council Chair Ni Aikotego says there has been a series of promises from those at the helm of affairs, but the promises are yet to be fulfilled. It is bad for the people of the community to drink such water, but we don't have any source of water. That's why we are, the people take that water. They themselves know the situation we are facing. And they are keeping on promising us. But we are waiting for them because since they are always they promise us, 
we are still waiting for the promise to be fulfilled. Command number one is a community that has no choice but to drink water from its waste. But no one deserves that. Chrissy Parker Wilson for Joy News. The policy think tank Imani Africa is insisting that the contract for the distribution of medical supplies with drones is ridiculous and must be revised. This is in reaction to claims by the Ghana Health Service boss, Dr. Anthony Nsiasaro, that the think tank has been peddling false figures about the expenses incurred in a typical Ghanaian health facility. He spoke on Newsfile. I don't know where oh, this calculation from. I know, even the blood when they are doing the testings and all these things cost 100 Ghana cities apart from the cost of the blood mm. so if he's doing these calculations he should have t given us the source where he got it from and he should I don't know where he got the 75 uh, cents cents from. yeah I give you an example if you take somebody who is coming for blood from Bagura to Kolebu is it 75 cents that's your own expense in, is in it four cities in hiring a taxi you mean yeah is it four cities even if he takes throttle mm -hmm. is it four cities so when somebody is giving this calculation, I've read it. Mm. He should come out and tell us. I know that he said that, uh, for example, Zipline delivers six uh, deliveries in a, in a day. Yes. Isn't it? It, is a, it is, I don't think it's true. So it is, it now it's up to, it's on him to give us where he got these figures and these things from. I can tell you, and I will say it emphatically here, that the calculation he's giving is all not correct. Mm. He should go to the National Blood Transfusion Services and get his calculation right. Uh, giving blood and then doing the test is not 12 CDs, 12 dollars equivalent. Okay. So it's not true. And then there's, uh, the, the drones don't, don't take only one pint at mm. a time. It can take four pints at a time if you need it. So the calculations he's doing... The drones don't take what? It's, it's 1.75 uh, kilos. Okay, 1.75 mm. okay. kilos. Okay, that's four pints. Okay, so... Yes. It can okay. take a four pints. Yes. So, yeah. so all what Imani is doing, mm. I'm surprised. Because the, the, the author of what he has done is one somebody who is a believer they have done. in technology. Okay. So when we are introducing technology to improve the service efficiency, and then he's bringing these calculations. So it's not on me. He has said it. So he has to prove to us where he got all his calculations from. But I can, I can, I can contest. I don't think it's right. Mm. The, the, there's a question that is being asked that is in a statement, Imani Africa says that the Ghana Health Service boss, Dr. Nsia Sari, does not understand the thrust of their argument. While well, president of the think tank, Franklin Kudo, joins us on the line now. Good afternoon, sir. Thanks for your time. Now, we've heard the Ghana Health Service boss. Why are you maintaining that he got it all wrong? Well, good afternoon to your listeners. First of all, we have to put on record that Imani nowhere claimed that the drone service would only carry a pint of blood. In fact, from our statement, which we released earlier, we never said so. Secondly, the contestation over the cost of blood. I think Dr. Nsiasari's position oh, is that United. the money should have used the retail level cost at the National Blood Transfusion Service. In fact, with all due respect, that's not how proper cost benchmarking is performed in this matter. Cost benchmarking does not take for granted all the inefficiencies of the system when trying to establish the true cost of an activity. But we base our analysis on several studies, such as the, um, the gentleman called Don Sumu et al., 2017, and Van Horst, where they came up with rigorous benchmarking for screening and cold storing uh, blood. So the fact of the matter is that, look, let's not allow Dr. Siansari to even confuse the debate. At between $11.5 $11 11 per kilogram to $21 per kilogram of, 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 of whatever is carried, drone health commodities transportation is extremely expensive. All we are trying to say to Mr. Tensiasar is really simple. If it took Rwanda nearly two years, first of all, they did the pilot, and the delivery rate in Rwanda right now is averaging six, six deliveries per day, and the country has spent close to $150,000 in did, two uh, years. Sorry to cut in, but can in I, your statement, you mentioned I, it's 10 I, can I, day. Sorry. So I'm just wondering why the figures are changing now. What? Sorry, what did you just say? The Rwandan example you're quoting, in your statement, you said they're doing about 10 deliveries a day. Now you're seeing six deliveries a day. I'm just trying to reconcile the figures now. I suspect you probably also didn't read well. I, I did, what sir. What is clearly there stated, an average of about six deliveries per day. 
And this is from Zipline's own PR publication, which they published. In fact, in any case, the argument we are making is quite simple. If Rwanda, where we are all benchmarking for this project, has spent just $150,000 in two years, including piloting, why are we starting without piloting if for the same number of years, two years, and going to spend a little over $10 million on this project? In other, oh, in in other case, Mr. Nsiasari has quickly forgotten that there have been some testing, uh, some piloting done for some health delivery using drones in this country. Oh, as, as, as recent as 2016. Mm. And the only reason why it didn't scale up was simply because, well, there was oh, no funding. I, I accept that that precedes his coming into office. Okay. The fact of the matter really is that there are many aspects of this deal that begs questions. Mm. One of them, obviously, is the costing. Okay. And the fact that he submits that there should not be any piloting is worrying because even Tanzania piloted this for 18 months. Oh, and even then, they were contesting the cost as well. So I think the conversations have to be had properly. And by the way, the contract that, is, that parliament is debating has actually aspired as far back as August 31st, 2018. Most of our analysis, if not all, are based on the contract document, which I suspect that necessary probably needs to read properly. I mean, these are things we need to discuss as a country. Let's right. not, let's oh, not yeah. admit that because something is novel, it's innovative. It becomes innovative if it adds to the bottom line and reduces our cost while providing good service. Okay, so uh, Imani's position is that the drone program should be piloted at a budget not exceeding $100,000 over a yes, period of six that's months. One of our positions. How, how did you determine that, that amount? Just help us understand what went yeah, into it. Because from historical data, even from the the figures that are coming from Rwanda, it is clear that if the country had spent mostly $150,000, including piloting, and has just done deliveries up until this time for nearly two years, how do you move on to start something without piloting and spend almost $10 million for the same number of years? The 100000 figure is simple. If you look at the, if you extrapolate topographical data, and indeed geographical data, Boy, from the areas that we think this piloting should be done around the northern region, you need to spend not less than $100,000 on this. In any case, that's what is done. In all medical field. you pilot something, even drugs, when they are uh, made, you, you do testing before you apply it across the country. You cannot just submit that because there's been piloting in Rwanda and Tanzania, there's no piloting that should be done in Ghana. Because, see, the reason why you need to do piloting is also because drone services are not like your typical flying kites. Even if kites, you need to determine the wind power and all of that. So you need to determine the terrain and the flight path of the drones before you even go ahead and pilot it. In any case, the other argument has been made. Why is it the case that with 600 deliveries per day, and when we are trying to copy from a country that does less than 10 deliveries in a day, we want to start the project as if there's a national emergency, there's a pandemic. That is the question we are asking. And by the way, there are many, 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 many. In fact, if you drew down further into this project, you realize that the 80-kilometer radius by which this drone service to, pro to, to provide it in the four regions is highly even um, inflated. You had there Franklin Kujo, he's president of Boy, Think Tank Imani Africa. Thank you, sir, for your time. Let's move on to some other stories. And the Ghanaian oil company Griffin Energy wants the Ministry of Energy and international oil firm Exxon Mobil to explain why they replaced them as their preferred indigenous company partner for the Deepwater Cape Three Points oil block. Ghana Oil Offshore Limited two weeks ago signed a joint operating agreement with a multinational oil exploration firm Exxon Mobil for Deepwater Cape Three Points area oil exploration. But a board member of Griffin Energy Africa, Dr. Kwame Owusu, is disputing the claim that Goyle subsidiary company, that's Ghana Oil Offshore Limited, was the preferred partner of ExxonMobil. He's been speaking to Joy News. As a member of the board of directors of Griffin Energy Africa Limited, I was elated to be informed on September the 8th, 2018, that out of the 27 aspiring partner companies, Griffin had been selected by ExxonMobil as its preferred indigenous Ghanaian company, partner for the Deepwater Cape Three Points block. In recent times, we have read in the Ghanaian press that Goyle has instead been selected 
as a preferred partner. When and for what reason or reasons was Griffin deselected and Goyle, which was in the unselected group of 26 companies, selected to become the preferred company? It will be prudent for both ExxonMobil and the government of Ghana to be very transparent and explain to both Griffin and the Ghanaian public how the decision was made. One would expect utmost transparency and fairness by a global company that should be expected to uphold the tenets of the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act of the United States of America. Well, the energy minister in Ghana Oil have declined to speak on the matter, but we have a statement from ExxonMobil. Uh, Michael E. Raymond Aqua joins me uh, with statement. Uh, Raymond, does ExxonMobil deny this claim? Okay, so all that they're saying is that ExxonMobil will carry out the work program as operator and have 80% interest. Ghana National Petroleum Corporation holds 15% and the Ghana Oil Company holds 5% interest. And they proceed to say that exploration activities, including acquisition of seismic data, and analysis are expected to commence by the end of this year. The addition of this block reaffirms ExxonMobil's commitment to pursuing a diverse set of high-quality projects in areas with large resource potential. They are excited to partner with the government of Ghana as they employ their significant upstream experience and technological expertise in assessing the exploration opportunities in this block. In fact, the statement was actually signed by Operations Media Manager, Public and Government Affairs, Swan Ganwith. So she actually signed the statement from ExxonMobil in this case. Thank you very much, Raymond. Boy, Up up with details there. You're listening to the Midday News on Joy 99.7 FM. With me, Benis Abubeidu Lansa. Still to come, Environment Minister allays fears of residents living in earthquake-prone areas after last weekend's tremor, saying they should trust God to protect them. We'll hear from him as he addresses Parliament. Meanwhile, residents say they're not leaving the area anytime soon. Boy, not- <laughs> My name is Kwame Sefakai, and most of you know me as a media personality, but I am also a family man. The UMB mobile banking app, UMB Speed App, saves me so much time by letting me do almost all of my banking transactions on my phone. The cardless withdrawal feature allows me to withdraw cash from any UMB ATM without an ATM card. I can also pay bills, transfer money, request for a loan, invest money, and so much more. So now, I can spend less time at the bank and more time with the ones I love. (laughs) <laughs> Bank anywhere and anytime with a UMB mobile banking app, UMB Speed App, and get the time to do what you love most. Download the UMB Speed App from your Android, iOS, or Windows phone today. Call 0302-633-988 for more information. UMB Speed App, Digibank, let's go! Boy, man. Thanks for staying here on the Midday News on Joy 99.7 FM. It's now time for sports, Ridwan Asante. Yes, um, Benis, we have to talk boxing because that's what is all over, you know, the plays Mm -hmm. and reflections on what happened on Saturday. And there's still talk about the magnitude and also nature of Isaac Dugway's shock defeat to Emmanuel Navarrete on Saturday night at Madison Square Garden in the States. The WBO Super Bantamweight champion got battered and had his face disfigured in the unanimous decision loss to the Mexican. Dugwe's trainer, Paul, who is also his father, has now revealed the causes of his son's poor showcase in the ring. In this fight, oh, you know, Isaac did not go into this fight fit because we had to use the sonar, you know, and steam room and all the madness to lose the weight. Because, you know, when we just did not, I, I, I wouldn't say we, we prepared, but not like how we used to prepare you know because we're having a lot of um, visitations like um we had all these royal visits and then we had um on the tour we came isaac had to travel from a training camp to ghana again travel here and there you know we did not have a full training camp so that really cost us you know this fight and we underestimated mexican and you know and we're relying on our power you know and you can see isaac's legs were gone because he wasn't fully fit you know um so what we can say is um you know i i i told isaac i'm i'm proud of him he's never let me down this is not a let down at the end of the day you know he's been winning so he has to also test defeat and bounce back. 
So you had father and child oh, yeah. dethroned WBO Super Bantamweight champion Isaac. Um, that's for the way there, mm. you know, for you. But, you know, is this stock excuse? Is it plausible, implausible? We like to analyze that at 1 p.m. on the Joy Sports Track. We sure will make a date with you. Thank you, Ridwana Sante, oh, yeah. with the latest from the world of sports. Now, the Greater Accra Police Command is investigating an incident involving four British schoolgirls and their teacher who were held at gunpoint and sexually assaulted last Saturday. According to British newspaper The Sun, the schoolgirls aged 16, between 16 and 17, were staying at world guest houses as part of a group of 10 on a charity mission to Accra. The attacker allegedly used his rifle to shoot and wound the security guard at the hostel after he tried to intervene. And the story goes on to say the accommodation was closed Close to the beach and the teenagers were staying in rooms of up to six at the site where there was also a caretaker and security team. The victims were flown home on Sunday and treated at a British hospital after the ordeal. Maxwell Akbaba is with our gender desk. He's been following up on this and joins us in the studio. Maxwell, what have you picked up from the police? Well, Ben, it's oh, difficult getting information um, from them, but in, we've been working um, our sources and in the past 30 minutes, we have had um, information that yes, the police is aware of this issue and it's been handled at the police headquarters. And what about the British High Commission? What have they been saying? Well, they'll not give us um, details on, on exactly what happened, but let me give you what the information they give to us. Quote, we are providing support to several British nationals following an incident in the Greater Accra and in close contact with the local authorities. Mm. Unquote. Short information they just gave us. Yeah. Great. Uh, Max Olagbagbada, what are details of that uh, incident? here on the Midday News. Now, it's been decades since seismologists predicted earth tremors and quakes along fault lines running through parts of Accra, but residents along these lines say they are not moving anytime soon. This was after a tremor in some suburbs of Accra. Let's take you back to explore Ghana's history with earthquakes, tremors, and the several warnings for action to be taken. Nancy M. F. Adradosi has more. The most destructive earthquake that struck the then Gold Coast and caused a lot of damage and loss of life and property it was the 22nd of June 1939 earthquake. 17 people were killed and 133 injured. Its magnitude was 6.5 on the Richter scale. After that, experienced there have been tremors that occurred on the 8th of January, 14th of February and 6th of March 1997. The 18th January 2010 rumors of an impending earthquake that reverberated across the country woke the whole nation up at dawn. While no one knew the source of rumor, friends, families and neighbors made phone calls, sent messages and knocked on doors to send warnings for people to wake up and leave their rooms. On the 24th of July 2014, an earth tremor hit part of Accra with residents of Botiano and neighboring communities confirming they felt the earth move. The Chief Executive Officer of Development Geo Information Services, Professor Imano Amamotra at the time, cautioned residents in the affected areas to either relocate or take steps to protect their buildings against earth tremors. Even this year, the Ghana Geological Survey Authority warned of an imminent earthquake in the country following three tremors which occurred on the same day, all on the 24th of March 2018. Again, there were warnings for people to avoid building in these areas, but it appeared their warnings fell on deaf ears as the population has rather doubled, if not tripled, in these areas over the years. Fast forward to just this Sunday, residents in Accra took to social media to express their fear after their buildings shook due to earth tremor. The Geological Service Authority says signs picked up show that the fault lines are active which means an earthquake can occur at any time. But are residents willing to move? What has happened to your property? Are you still going ahead with it I'm in spite, in spite of the I'm warning still, from I'm the... Still, I'm, not, I'm not moving anyway. I'm not moving. No, the government should come in with the, uh, the, 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 the reclamation of the, uh, of the place and the uh, re-engineer of the area. I mean, I have actually complained that some of these houses here, it's very dangerous to live in some of these houses here. Uh -huh. Where I am. Now, CMF Adra Josie with that report. Well, Environment Minister oh, Professor Kwabna from Pombwating has allayed fears of residents living in these areas, and he says they should trust God to protect them. He's been addressing Parliament from where Joseph Opoku Gapo joins us on the line. Joseph, so beyond trusting God's protection, what is the ministry doing to prevent a potential disaster? Uh, so he was oh, in the house to respond to other questions relating to science and technology, but 
in the interaction with the media after that, he indicated that it's about time that even when people are doing construction, uh, they should ensure that quality equipment are used. But generally, he says that this is a situation that is not predictable. Accra is an earthquake prone area. He noted that there is the need for residents to be cautious. But he says very little can be done about the situation currently. <clears throat> Thank you. Joseph um, Opoku Gapo joining us from Parliament. It's now time to know what's trending. Mapito CBD is here with the latest. Well, hashtag Boy, Human man. Rights Day is trending. And at Jeremy Corbyn says, 70 years ago today, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights was adopted. The worldwide challenges to human rights are enormous. We remember the words of Martin Luther King when he said, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. And at Refugee says, it's your identity. It could be the key to health care. Every person on our planet has a right to a nationality. And as we mark Human Rights Day today, we ask you, has Ghana done enough to protect the rights of its citizens? Get onto our Facebook Pages Boy, and leave your tweets and comments. But that's how we end this edition of the Midday News on Joy 99.7 FM with me, Benis Abubedu Lansa. Top story. After eight years of service to his nation, former President John Kufo reveals he's yet to be paid his ex gratia. There's more news when you log on to myjoyonline.com. Thanks for your company. Good afternoon. Boy,